Well, thank you. I was just um, kind of warming up the crowd um, as you guys joined in. And Sam, it, it's nice. I know we've talked on the phone, but actually, I think never even met in person. Um, just for the group, I'm Michael Goldberg, and I'm the executive director of our new Veal uh, Institute for Entrepreneurship. And I also teach at the Weatherhead School of Management. And um, it's a thrill to be able to welcome you, Sam, kind of back to campus um, yeah, not it. in the normal way. Um, this is a series that we kicked off kind of earlier this year and sort of given the crisis and the changes, we've, um, we've actually really ramped up our programming. So um, we have your friend Arti Shadna is going to join us tomorrow oh, great. Um, as part of the, the seminar series. And, and we really appreciate you taking a few minutes to join. The format that we have for all of our sessions is to have a student at Case moderate, um, and we're, we're thrilled that Raghav Rao um, was able to do that today. So what I'd ask you to do, um, and, I'll, and I'll turn it over to Raghav to get things going, please use the chat function, um, A, as a means to network. So if, if you um, wanna put your LinkedIn profile and, and introduce yourself and put your questions in the chat and what Raghav's gonna do um, with Sam today, sort of integrate um, questions that he has, questions that are coming from the chat. And so we'll have an hour together um, in conversation, but, but please take advantage of this kind of uh, ability to, to be together in a, in a different kind of community today to, to share your questions. And again, Sam and Raghav, thank you so much for doing it. And, and Raghav, let me turn it over to you to, to kick things off. Yeah, thank you so much, Mike. So um, I'm Raghav Rao. I'm a graduate student, and Mike says this is like one of few graduate students that do this, so I feel super lucky to be here. Um, so I work at the um, Institute for Smart, Secure, and Connected Systems, or ISAACs for short, and we do a lot of multidisciplinary research with Internet of Things and how it intersects with the world at large, whether that's public infrastructure or healthcare and energy. Um, so this call felt super relevant, and I'm super excited to be here. Uh, Sam? Great. So uh, just quick intro, Sam Jadala. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, long history. I'm at Apple right now doing uh, running their home, build, building out their basically services for the home. I uh, joined about just over a year ago. I uh, was a case in the, uh, in the 80s. Uh, when uh, when computers were, when the PC was just getting started, it was actually an incredible time. Uh, went to Case because of, um, uh, because they really had, they had something called computer engineering, which was, you know, sort of the, the digital side of, of electrical and just kind of thinking about how to build computers and operating systems. And that's what attracted me there. And they had a great financial aid package, which really mattered to me. Uh, somebody who couldn't afford college, uh, so it was a uh, it was a great place. Went from Mike from there uh, to Microsoft, um, and I could talk talk a little bit about that. And then um, ended up uh, being vice president of a, a division at Microsoft. It was about a twelve billion dollar division. Uh, was uh, incredibly fortunate to kind of join Microsoft when it was fourteen hundred people and and stay until it was about fifty five thousand people. Uh, and then I went off to go do uh, investing. I was a venture investor for a while, and then decided to to have the third phase of my career, which was to kind of be an entrepreneur uh, later in my life, which was kind of kind of wild. So corporate exec, investor, and entrepreneur. Now I, I kind of am in the bonus act of my career right now as I think about it, which is trying to be an entrepreneur in a big company. Uh, I joined Apple uh, mostly because the people and the, and the opportunity to come in and help Apple figure out how to do the home in a new way. Um, so, so, I'm joining you from Sun Valley, Idaho, uh, in the mountains of Idaho right now. So thank you for having me. Thanks for being here, Sam. Um, so to start off with something that we're all facing right now is the lockdown and quarantine. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how that's affecting you and how you're achieving a work-life balance and what working from home looks like for you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I've always wanted to do a little bit more virtual uh, and remote work. Uh, as I got uh, older in my career, I was wanted to more flexibility mattered a lot to me. Uh, so the ability to sort of 
work where I, where I really enjoyed my life, uh, like the mountains, uh, was something that I wanted to do more. Apple was very much against that. It was very much a, like you have to be, you know, we built a $5 billion building that you can see behind Mike. And uh, it's a fantastic place, but Apple is very much like you had to be, uh, had to be there. So I was commuting about two and a half hours a day uh, from where I live in San Francisco down to Cupertino. Um, and uh, so in some ways, this, this lockdown is teaching us new skills. Uh, I think we, we've learned and we figured out how to, how to uh, work virtually. Uh, I'm pretty much on video conferencing about uh, eight to 10 hours a day. Uh, with the team, in some ways, uh, we've had to implement, you know, new new practices like ten minute breaks, and you get up and move around. Uh, but I think on the other hand, we've learned how to um, work very efficiently, um, and there's been some advantages, uh, some advantages to it. So we'll see what the new normal is when we when we return back to work. I'm hoping that um, that this sort of mixes things up. Uh, right now, I'm pretty fortunate. I'm here with my my kids. Uh, my youngest one is a recent grad of Case, um, and uh, his girlfriend, who's also a grad of Case, uh, is here. Uh, so we have seven of us right now in this house, and and so we uh, all are all in simultaneous video conferences. I've had to upgrade the uh, Wi-Fi network here to make sure it worked uh, well to support it, uh, and then we have uh, fun dinners together. So so I feel, uh, despite all the circumstances, I feel incredibly fortunate. Thank you. That's uh, that sounds really fun. So to um, kick things off, you know, you've like you said, you've been in a bunch of different roles um, from big companies to small. Um, so how is your current role at Apple different from any of your previous roles? Uh, so the way to th the way I think about it is, you know, I joined Microsoft when it was fourteen hundred people, and I was uh, I was one of the first systems engineers hired at the company. So they didn't really even know what the role was. In fact, I remember answering an ad uh, for a database engineer at Microsoft. Turned out they didn't even have a database. Uh, they didn't know really what they were looking for. Uh, and, uh, and I got fortunate just to join it. Um, uh, actually, funny side story, my classmates, uh, all engineering guys from, from Case, all tried to talk me out of it um, because they thought that Microsoft wasn't a legit, serious, like OS company, didn't know how to build operating systems. Um, but I really liked the people. They had a 31 year old CEO named Bill Gates. Um, and it was, um, it was, uh, it was a journey I just wanted to join. And, and really there wasn't a lot uh, to it other than that. Um, so I, I, uh, so I, was part of that company from the start, uh, 1,400 people, 55,000 people. So I was really one of the folks that was there um, and helped shape things. And it was really an exciting place to be. Um, I'm entering uh, Apple in a very different way where it's, you know, already has well over 100,000 people. It's one of the largest companies on the planet, certainly one of the most profitable companies on the planet. Um, and, uh, and I'm the new guy. Uh, now I've joined at a senior role, but I'm still a new guy. Uh, and so, um, so I've taken this as an opportunity. I, I describe it as um, I, I decided I was going to be Willy Wonka, uh, uh, Charlie and Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory, if you know the, if you know the movie. Um, I just was going to be amazed by everything. I wanted to go into Apple. And what I realized was, was my experience um, only mattered so much if I could figure out how to take my experience and apply it into Apple. What that meant was I had to learn Apple's culture. I learned how Apple made decisions and how they got things done and what worked and what didn't work at Apple and perfectly good ways of working and perfectly good ideas um, in other places may not work at Apple. And so I had to make sure I didn't fall into that trap. Um, and one of the things I've learned in my career is that the culture of a company really, really matters. Um, and if you can figure out and understand that culture and adapt it to and, and adapt yourself to that culture in a way that uh, still allows you to be productive in the way you know how to get work done, um, then um, then magic happens. And so that's what I'm on the journey at Apple, which is I'm trying to learn the culture and, and understand that I've been here just over a year. Um, so far, so good. But it is pretty cool to be learning new tricks um, at this point in my career <clears throat> and uh, um, and, and maintain what I call a growth mindset, which is just 
sort of being open-minded to really learn. So I love it because every day I'm, I'm a kind of amazed. I'm like, wow, how does that really work? I can look at something and think it's the most insane, broken, stupidest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> and, and I have no idea how it's working. And then I realize it is actually working. Um, the other part about it that's pretty cool is um, when I look at all the things that don't work at Apple, like all the things that I think about are really broken, um, all I see is opportunity. So I'm like, wow, this company is that amazing. They are doing this amazing work. They're that profitable. And all of these things are still broken um, and need help. And I go, okay, well, that's why they hired me. That's where I can come in and, and, uh, and help them. So, so it's, a, it's been an incredible experience. Um, and uh, and I use it as an opportunity to feel like I'm, you know, almost a fresh grad again, coming in um, and just trying to absorb and learn as much as I can. Awesome. So speaking of um, growth mindset and a lot of opportunity, the um, recent quarantine pandemic has really changed the home paradigm for everyone. Um, and being the new head of Apple Home, how do you see that affecting? Does that change any of uh, how you saw what you thought what Apple would be doing in any way at all? Uh, not, not entirely. I do think that um, that you know the home, the home. It's going to be interesting. Uh, so I've started buying, you know, in the stocks in the market just because I think you know, the, the market will start to recover. But one of the sectors I'm interested in is the home, the home space. So, you know, home improvement. So I'm, I'm, I've spent now about a month in this house uh, with very few hours outside of the, uh, outside of the house. And my, my son is at Home Depot as we speak buying. So I am, I am improving the house. So I kind of feel like um, this is going to be like, there's more here. And if you think about now bring work into your home, um, and doing it, you know, home office and people sort of commuting, uh, the nature of commuting and how much you need to commute is going to change. Um, I think that now that people feel comfortable in a video conference and engaging in a, in a, in a pretty deep way and being very efficient, I think it's going to open up some new opportunities. I wouldn't say it's really changed our strategy. I think it's too early to think about um, you know, are we going to go chase something new that we didn't think about before, uh, before COVID hit? I wouldn't say that that's the case at all. Um, but what I say that, um, that things like video conferencing and FaceTime and all of these things, like at the younger generation, you probably FaceTime a little more than we do, but my friend group, we're always audio. We're just on the phone. It's all audio calls. All of that has changed. Every single call by default now is, is video. Um, there's a lot more that gets communicated. It's a, just a different experience. Um, and, and I think that's going to be permanent. I think it's going to stay. And so better cameras in the home, how you use vision, intelligence in the home. Uh, what, what's clear is the home opportunity for us to bring intelligence and capability is, is um, it's needed. Uh, the challenge in the home is it's a very low price point. People don't pay much, um, and we really haven't figured out how to make things super useful for people um, that uh, that it's super compelling. Um, but but I think we're you know I think there's some good thinking around how that's going to evolve um, over the next few years, and and it's a it's a it's a it's a long journey. We we think about the platforms, the personal platform is your phone and your laptop, um, and that's kind of the way we moved. And now what happened? Think about the home as your platform and what are all the capabilities that can happen there. So, so I'm excited about that opportunity, but it's still, I'd call it the very early innings for this game. Awesome. So we have a couple of questions from uh, the audience. So Mitch, um, he says he's a crew management senior and uh, he asked what was the most difficult about the entrepreneurship process. I know you talk a little bit about the 1% principle where running a company as if the 1% is likely to happen is not a good way to run it. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. So I, um, so uh, in my forties, I decided uh, that for sport, I would uh, start a company. Um, and it wasn't really because I wanted to do anything other than I thought it would be a really great growth experience for me. I thought it would be fun to learn how to, how to start a company from scratch. Uh, I, I started a, several divisions at Microsoft from scratch, but I was always part of a really big balance sheet and a very profitable company and, and all of that and a great brand. Uh, and so starting something like literally, uh, you know, solo alone 
uh, and, and using my own money uh, to start it was daunting. Uh, but I was driven by it. I was all, always felt entrepreneurial. I always felt like even at Microsoft, I was an entrepreneur in this, in this company. And what Microsoft was amazing about doing was uh, pulling together all of these leaders who were basically entrepreneurs. Bill Gates had this amazing ability to have people in the company who were entrepreneurial and he could keep them all in the company and get them working together um, despite sort of it might not work anywhere else. And I think he was, uh, he, he was phenomenal at that skill set. Um, and so we had very creative people who really wanted to get things done. Um, and we had an environment where we could work together in a collaborative way and, and I think achieve really amazing things. So, uh, so when I set off to, to start, uh, I had, I had bought some, uh, lock technology from a, a guy in oh, Florida who, who designed this, uh, this new lock style, um, and didn't, and he ran out of money. He worked on it for about five, six years, raised a bunch of money, ran out, didn't quite get the product done. It was too complicated. It was too hard. It wasn't mature enough. So I acquired the IP and I started kind of noodling around with it, hired some folks to kind of kind of do it. Um, and then that just sort of led me on a journey. And when it was good enough, um, I decided to go raise money. And I was able to raise money from uh, Greylock Partners, which is a phenomenal company. Ashim Chanda, so tomorrow you'll, you might, you'll hear from Arti, but uh, Ashim, Arti's husband, uh, was my classmate uh, at, at, uh, at Case. Um, and uh, we were friends back then, which is kind of cool. He wasn't the guy who invested, Reed Hoffman, a guy named Reed Hoffman, who started LinkedIn, was the guy who invested uh, in my company. And, uh, and, and I had to go learn all new skills. And I had to learn entirely new skills, which is how to run a company, how to hold everything together. And the thing about, about being an entrepreneur that I think was the most exhilarating was, you know, you get to chart a course and you really get to figure things out. The hardest part about being an entrepreneur is literally every single day, it feels like you are going to get blown up somehow. Uh, every single day, uh, you only have two emotions. One emotion is this incredible exhilaration of just like, I got this thing. It's amazing. I am so excited. I can't stand it. It's great. I don't want to sleep. I just want to work on this. And then the other emotion is it's over. I'm dead. It like everybody's quitting on me. I have no money. I am never going to make it. Um, and so you literally run from, uh, from, from those two emotions and there's nothing in the middle and, and it is exhausting. Um, I felt a little of that in the early days of Microsoft, but it was a much bigger company. You know, we had a few thousand employees, uh, but we still felt like we could die. So, so what you learn as an entrepreneur, what I learned was um, that leadership matters that people follow you, that they're joining the team because they believe in you. Um, investors join because they believe in you. Um, and you have to do everything you can to, to, uh, uh, to, to lead, but not mislead, uh, to engage with uh, people on what you think is the substance and to set a culture for the company that allows people to do the best work. And so I thought my number one job was to recruit great people. And my number two job was to create a great work environment for them to do their best work. And that, like, those were the two things. And the third number, uh, third thing was make sure I have enough cash to, uh, to pay them. And, and like, I got to do those things. Uh, and it turns out I have a lot of other jobs, but like, you got to stay focused on just a few, few things. Um, and as an entrepreneur, you can worry about, there's a lot of things to worry about and, and I, and you just can't handle them all, frankly. And, and, you know, as I, as I said in this article called so close, um, that I wrote after auto uh, blew up. So the quick story with auto was we, uh, we built a phenomenal product. Um, it took us two years longer. I had to replace my co-founder and, and, and uh, it took me two years longer. So I ran my cash laid. I had less cash in the bank than I would hope, but we were, we were doing okay. We launched a phenomenal product and we were in the process of getting acquired. And, um, and it made sense for all of us. It was going to be a fantastic thing. We were going to help this public company uh, turn themselves around and we were going to be the digital platform and everything. Um, and then the morning of the close, actually the morning that we were supposed to get money wired, um, they called and said, yeah, we're not wiring money and we're not even 
uh, doing the deal anymore under any circumstances. Happened to be a, a week before Christmas. Uh, it was impossible to go get more money at that point because now the biggest acquirer that I could get just walked. So they, so now we're kind of a scorned company. Uh, makes it very difficult to go to anybody to get money. And, uh, and so instead of telling everybody that we had this you know, great path ahead, um, I had to switch my speech and, and tell everybody that we were on our last payroll um, and that we would be shutting down right before Christmas. So it was incredibly difficult. It was the most difficult period of my life. Um, and there was moments when you're not sure, uh, you're not sure you're going to make it through. It's kind of crazy. Um, and uh, you feel like you let down your investors and your team and everybody. Um, and so, um, and it was kind of crazy. So I shared, I buried my soul in this article called So Close. And it was interesting, the feedback I got. One big feedback was like, that's phenomenal. Most entrepreneurs never talk about the difficult parts of being an entrepreneur. They only talk about the great success. The other part is, I had all these sort of, you know, Monday morning quarterback uh, people who had never been on the field, never thrown a football, um, and were telling me how to, you know, trying to coach me in new ways to do it. Um, and, and so I basically was like, screw you. You know, like, uh, I, I sort of two things I walked away with. One is, unless you're an entrepreneur, I actually don't care what you think. Uh, unless you've actually been on the field and tried it and, and learned, your feedback is not useful to me, um, and, uh, and I don't really care. I thought I understood what it meant to be an entrepreneur. Until I did it, I realized I knew nothing. And then once, when I was an entrepreneur, I, knew, I realized it was a, a whole new skill set because the emotional drain, the emotion behind being an entrepreneur is entirely different than you can ever imagine. Um, and so, so I had to build thick skin to realize, you know, screw you, if you, if you weren't here, don't criticize because you don't, you don't even get it. Uh, the second big realization I got out of that was um, that the difference between success and failure, if success is you made a shitload of money and failure is you didn't make it, <laughs> uh, is almost um, not quite arbitrary, but it is almost there, okay? Meaning there are so many paths uh, and so many little things that succeed, timing, the market, you just realize that, um, you know, I was one hour away from being considered this fabulous entrepreneur who, you know, who was a great corporate exec and investor and now a great entrepreneur. And then I'm on the other hand, I'm a failure, right? Um, because the company didn't make, well, I built a product that nobody could build. Apple wanted to buy the product. They were loved it. They were like, literally they hired my team, you know, people, because they were like, this was phenomenal. We built something that was amazing. Um, but I would say that um, uh, when you look at like, you know, if you did the right time, if you just happened to get bought at the right thing or, or the IP market just opened up for you or like you happen to raise capital at the right period, you're phenomenal. Now imagine if you're an entrepreneur right now and COVID hit. Okay, there are going to be thousands of startups that are going to shut down in the next two months. Thousands. Okay, were they, were they failures? Or did the guy who did Mark Cuban, who was like super smart guy, Mark Cuban is a, you know, great guy, but he sold something at a period when you could sell anything <laughs> and you could sell it for billions of dollars. Was he more of a success than somebody else who built something really substantial and, and didn't get it sold? So, so I, I am very critical of people when they think about success and failure. Um, I think it's a journey. Um, I think you, you know, you try different things. Um, and, and what matters is, did you do it in a quality way? Did you get great people around you? Did you build something substantial? Did you focus on the right business, you know, elements? And if it all lines up, you're going to get lucky and you're going to shoot the gauntlet. Um, and, you know, it only takes one bullet to kill you. So, and you're being shot at all day long. Uh, and so, so, um, so I think you can't take it personally. Um, and I learned to create a little bit of distance between the outcome and the journey. I was all about the journey now, and I'm, I'm a lot less about, uh, a lot less about the outcome. Thank you. Um, so would you mind talking a little bit about auto itself? Because everything about it is so, I don't want to say outrageously new, but it's, um, it's, it's an 
it seems like a very expensive product. If, if you just tell someone their first reaction is, oh my God, $700 for a lock. It's the first time of someone call a door lock a home entry experience. Um, it's the first time I've heard someone address um, planned obsolescence and actually design a lock that gets better over time because that's you know um, a frustration right now that you buy something and then two years you need to replace it. Um, so everything about it is different. And in So Close, you talk about just how um, how cool it was that you had the Swiss watchmaker and he said, the gears are so cool. Can we use this? Um, like arguably very talented people were so impressed by it. But on paper, it seems like everything wrong with if you went by conventional advice. Um, so going through that same thing of what do you do? Um, and Andrew yeah. Roth also has a similar question with how do you make those decisions at that level? And how do you, how do you just deal with... Um, that process where everything that you think is right goes against the grain of what you're told is right? Yeah, so, so there's a couple questions in there. Um, at the end of the day, what I realized, uh, one thing I realized is an entrepreneur, you're, uh, you have to find your own conviction. So you gotta find your own belief. And it's very, very hard. Um, uh, because everybody will give you inputs and what you have to decide is what are the inputs I'm going to listen to? What are the inputs I'm going to take? How do I reflect on that? But how do I keep true to what I need to do? It's really hard because if you are, um, I don't know if you follow the Enneagram, but it's kind of like uh, Myers-Briggs. It's like a personality thing. Anyways, I'm a three. Three is an achiever. Achiever uh, is you want to succeed and you want to succeed by other people's standards. Uh, but I'm also a four, which is a little bit more of an independent. Um, and what I find is it's very, um, I, had to, I had to pick my, my, uh, my mission uh, and I had to be willing to test it. Okay, so I had to be willing to put it out there and have people shoot at it and be okay with that and learn as much as I can from that. And they often say there's like three roles, right, you need in a, in a form of company. Um, and one is the dreamer, okay? The dreamer is like, you know, that's me. The dreamer is the creative person who's like, I believe this can happen even though people don't think it's possible, okay? And then you need a, the realist, uh, and, and, uh, and the realists are, are like the people say, okay, all right, big picture. I get it. But like, how am I, what am I going to do tomorrow? Like, what am I going to do between tomorrow and then two weeks? What am I going to do the next three months? What do I need to do? Because what you're talking about is like a 10 year vision, but like, we got to figure out something. And then the third person is the critic. Okay. The critic says that's BS. It will never work. Okay. You actually want all three roles. Okay. Now they're not all equal. Okay, one person has to be in charge. In the case of me as the entrepreneur, I think it's the dreamer. Um, but I definitely was not afraid to surround myself. In fact, I reached out to find people that were the realists and the, and the critics. Pulling those together, what, what happened is the dreamer creates something that like nobody could imagine before that is like out there. Okay, and it breaks all sorts of norms, but it will be exciting and cool. The realist figures out how to sort of make this thing come to life. And the critic figures out how to make it great, okay? How to make it bulletproof, how to make it resilient. And I needed all of those, uh, all of those together. So when I set out, I didn't think about it as a lock. I thought about it as a home entry system. Why? Because I believe that people cared about security. I believe that people would pay money for it. I believe that people cared about design and they cared about bringing design and security um, together and convenience and those th three things. And everybody I talked to said, yeah, yeah. Now I didn't set out to say, hey, let me go design a lock for 700 bucks. That wasn't how I started. <laughs> okay, let's go design it for 299, right? Let's go be there. Well, it turns out when you sit down on the journey, we didn't get there. Like the first version was gonna be there. Next version was gonna come in at a much lower price. We never got there. Um, but I, I decided that at some way along the line, I decided that our reputation as a company was gonna be built on our first product. And I wanted that first product to be kick ass. And I did not care if we didn't sell millions and millions and millions of units. I wanted people to pay attention to us and, and believe that we could build something that nobody else could. 
And then I could always figure out how to do it next generation. And I already had that kind of under plans. So, so that was, that was what, but, but I did get shot at. Like that was people were like, Hey, you know, that's great, Sam, but that lock, you know, you should sell that same lock for 150 bucks. I was like, go ahead. If you, if you can figure out how to do that, <laughs> go ahead. But I was trying to cater to somebody who cared about design, cared about convenience, cared, cared about security. And when you look at how much people spent on their home and home improvement and what they did, they were spending way more than that on much sillier things in their home. Um, and, and, uh, and I felt like this was something that was going to be valuable. I still believe that. Okay, just to, to know, I think that security should not be cheap, uh, or it doesn't have to be cheap. I think if it's uh, if it's intelligent and secure, people will will pay. You know, nobody has nobody has built a lock anything like auto yet. Okay, it's still now a couple of years later. Nobody's nobody's come up with uh, you know anything even close, um, and you know we'll see. But anyways, that's that was the philosophy behind what I was trying to do. I was perfectly like I said, you know. Uh, I knew that when people focused on price, I was, I was bummed that price became the headline. That really pissed me off um, as opposed to the greatness of the product. Uh, but because nobody had seen that before, <laughs> it turns out most locks, if you buy a brand new door, most locks cost more than that, but it's buried in the price of a door and people don't even know it. And so anyways, that was the media picked up on that. and That, that became the issue. But frankly, I still, I still, Last point on this is I did have a moment where I had to make a choice about price and I had a choice. One thing I could have done on the first version is sold it at no margin and it would have been $4.99 and I would have taken price off the issue and, and, but I wouldn't have made any profit or I could have sold it for a margin, had a business um, and try to go. And one of my advisors gave me advice, which is like, do the right thing for the business. Um, and that's what I thought. And I just didn't think that price was going to be that big of an issue. Looking back, you know, I could have easily done the other thing. I could have done four ninety nine, dollars and maybe I would have been better off. I would have run out of money a lot sooner, but I, you know, ran out of money anyway. So. <laughs> oh, Thank you. Um, so we have a question um, from Cecilia Hampton. Um, you were talking about earlier about having your own conviction and she says she's a high school senior and uh, she didn't apply to business school. Is it absolutely necessary to have a business degree in order to start a company? No. One word answer. Um, is there I don't know. I mean, listen, I work for, I work for one guy named Bill Gates who, you know, <laughs> And then, and then I work at Apple, you know, and, and uh, Steve Jobs, I, you know, I think that um, there's a lot we can get into, like what I think the value of college is, um, you know, I was on the board of trustees for, you know, I'm an emeriti now, so I was on the board of trustees for Case for 16 years. Um, uh, at one point, so I was, a, I was probably 26 uh, or seven or eight, something like that at Microsoft and my career is like taking off and Steve Ballmer was giving me a lot of responsibility and, and, uh, and I basically told him I wanted to uh, take a leave and go get an MBA. And he turned to me and he said, well, how many MBAs do you want? And I said, well, I was just thinking about getting one degree. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, no, how many MBAs do you want? He goes, just go hire them. <laughs> he goes, what do you want? And, uh, and then, you know, part of my learning was surround yourself with people to have the skill set you need. I was actually on the best MBA program I could ever get, which was at Microsoft. I happened to be in a great company. I was learning incredibly fast. It was massive growth mode. So that was by far for me personally at the time, that was the best decision. So um, a lot of case seniors right now are going to leave college into a world that's very different from when they enrolled in college. Do you have any advice for them as they face a completely different economy coming out? I mean, we've been in this incredible bull run for, you know, well over a decade. Um, you know, when I, when, I, when I started at Microsoft, um, Two months later, we had the crash of 87, which was uh, at the time, you know, one of the biggest crashes since, uh, uh, you know, in, in decades. Uh, I didn't even know what, I didn't even know what a crash meant. I didn't know what stock options were. I didn't know what stocks were. I didn't understand why everybody got all upset. Um, and, um, 
And what over time, what I realize is, you know, this economy is, you know, there's always ups and downs. Uh, it's over a long period. Um, I think every time we come out of it a little bit stronger and a little bit better. Um, and, and typically in difficult periods, it's actually, it, it forces you to be more creative. Um, and I think you actually learn more um, in more difficult circumstances than in um, easy circumstances when everything seems to work. Uh, and, uh, and we've been in that period for the last 10 years. So, um, so I think we're coming in, I, you know, my, my, um, my advice to uh, people coming out of college is always pretty simple. Um, one is pick your boss. The most important thing you can do is like find somebody to work for that you that that gives you the space that understands you that figures out how to play to your strengths and and how to help you grow and and like that's a big deal. Um, and then two is adapt. You know, is learn. Is just you're in this mode uh, to go and learn and just try to you know do the best you can and, and achieve. Um, it's it's. Um, what I love about our country in this period right now is um, when I, when I came out of the case, it was, uh, you know, it was General Motors talking about a pension and you could work there for 30 years and you get a pension when you were 55. And like, that was the big reason to go. And like, that doesn't exist anymore. And what's phenomenal is, um, you know, you can get together with a couple of buddies and, try to start something and spin something up. Um, I do it on the side now. I'm still doing it. Like it's my love starting things up. Uh, had I sold auto and made all this money, I was going to build an incubator so I could like get people to come. Cause I was like, I have 20 things that I would love to go start 20 companies. Uh, uh, and I just needed the people for it. And I think we're in this incredible economy where uh, even now you can still go and it's really a question of how much risk you can afford, meaning how much does it cost to live? Um, and I think what's great now is it's, um, you know, you can do more in Cleveland than you could have ever have done, certainly than I could have done when I came out. Um, and you can live in, in places uh, and create companies all over the country uh, much easier than you ever could have in the past. So it's a, so I don't know, I, I kind of think it's a great time. I mean, I, I know it's different than what you went in, but like, shit, it's going to be different again in two years, I hope. Uh, and so just adapt and learn and say, okay, well, what, what does it present to me, right? What is the world presenting to me right now, like that I can do that I probably couldn't do before, but I could do. And what's awesome is when you're young and you're, and you're flexible, uh, you, can, you can take advantage of that. Uh, people who are older and they've got like commitments and families and burn rates and expenses and all this kind of stuff, they're actually less flexible uh, and they can't adapt to the newest things that are presented, uh, but you can. And so, I don't know, figure that out. That's what's awesome. Um, so to figure it out, both Tristan Sexton and Igor Tudelman ask what books or, um, I'm sorry, you know, uh, it's Charles Lawney and Tristan Sexton both, both ask what books or resources have helped you in your entrepreneurship journey? So entrepreneurship is like two things, right? It's like um, the intellectual side, okay, which is how do I make decisions and how do I build a business and how do I like, you know, figure out product market fit and like all of that kind of stuff. And then there's the emotional side, which is like, how do I survive this thing? Okay. How do I just get the grit to go through? So, uh, so there's two, two things. So uh, books, best books, I probably would say is um, uh, shoe dog. Is that the one? Uh, the Nike founder. Uh, phenomenal book that's going to be about grit okay that's much more about that's all about the whole book is about like till he like, like starts to make Nike successful like it's because it's all about that that it, it it's it's amazing how long it takes to become an overnight success okay it's amazing and it takes years to become an overnight success and and what it and the grind it takes um, so that shoe dog is one um, another one is um, uh, thinking and bets, um, 
by Annie Dukes. Um, that's really about understanding that there is no right and wrong decision. It's all probabilities. And what does that mean? And how do you, how do you manage your probabilities of your decisions and, and recognizing that, that, that like, like I said, success and failure isn't a binary thing. It's a probability thing, right? I could have, you know, 98% probability that this company is going to make a billion dollars, right? But when that 2% hits, am I really a failure or did it, the 2% hit? Like, so thinking in bets is a really good, um, uh, really good one. Um, and, uh, uh, and then, um, there's a book on grit. Um, and I think it's called grit. I can't remember, uh, uh, which is also a very, uh, good one because it just talks about the resilience and what it means. Um, I'll get it if I can't remember the, the exact name, but anyways, it talks about resilience and, and what it means. Um, an entrepreneur, literally like we go down with the ship. It is just, I'll tell you what, how many times every entrepreneur that called me after I wrote my so close article and like founders of companies, you know, who are people who are individually worth a billion dollars or more uh, called and said, I cannot tell you how many times my company almost died. I cannot tell you how many times. Okay, like how we pulled it. Reed Hoffman said, you know, PayPal, we were 20 days away from shutting down, 20 days. And we got the management team and we had everybody come in and pitch ideas on what they were going to do after, after uh, PayPal failed. <laughs> right? And uh, one idea that somebody brought up sort of got them to survive another 60 days, which got them to survive a little bit longer, which then they ended up selling for a few billion dollars. Um, and then they built, you know, the next thing and all they went off and became the PayPal mafia. But every single entrepreneur uh, that reached out to me was like, yeah, you know, people think it was easy or it was always a straight line or it was always destined for success. They have no idea how many times we thought we weren't going to make it, we were going to shut down. So that grit is, uh, you know, is important. So those would be the three I'd start with. Them. So um, you graduated with a degree in computer engineering at Case, but are there any non-engineering courses you took and would you recommend them? Um, so my best classes at Case were non-engineering. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I was unusual in the sense that I took, um, my minor was in theater uh, so the minor work I did was in theater. I decided to take theater. I'm not even sure why I chose that, but um, I just liked it. And um, I was horrible as like an actor, but um, I would say the most useful classes I took were theater because what I realized as an engineer uh, was that um, communication and teamwork really mattered and getting people excited about something really mattered. And theater was like, how do you engage with people? And so that was a huge thing. And then I also took a bunch of um, graduate classes at the Weatherhead School. And uh, so I learned how to program in COBOL, <laughs> which at the time was really old. And by the way, if you know how to program in COBOL right now, I think uh, many governments are trying to hire people right now to do the stimulus programming because all the, all the systems are still written in COBOL. But um, I took a bunch of uh, management classes. Um, I would basically, the, the, my biggest criticism of the engineering per curriculum uh, in general, not at just case, but everywhere, um, is that um, if you're gonna do programming, computer science, you don't really need much of the engineering discipline. Um, and you're way better off in me, in my view, having a well, like if I had to hire, hire great people, what I look for in great people is, um, are they smart? Can they communicate? Do they believe in teamwork, okay? Are they really committed to the purpose of what we're trying to do or are they committed to themselves? If they're committed to the purpose of what we're trying to do and they're excited about that, that's great. I want somebody who's got drive, who can like, who can move. I'd ra much rather sort of help somebody stay between the guidelines, but they're, they know how to step on the gas and they're going and I'm just like, hey, all right, come back here, stay on this path. Versus uh, somebody who is looking for direction and somebody who always needs me to kick them in the ass to move forward. Like, I just don't have time for that. And so, so this, the things that I find help in my, in my groups, uh, like right now where I have a startup inside of a really big company, um, I want driven people who 
uh, are creative, who don't need to know what, you know, don't, don't think, oh, let me flip to the back pages of the textbook to figure out what the answers are. Because in life and in work, there are no answers. Okay, you don't know. You're going to know three years later, and then you're going to get to guess, well, maybe I, maybe that was the right answer. Maybe that was the wrong answer. I don't know. Like, I could have done thinking and bets. Like, who knows how it could have played out had you done something differently. You will never, there is no right answer in any of this. Okay, there is, there is just simply no right answer. There's what's the best answer I can make right now? What's the best decision I can make right now based on what I know? And how do I get as much information as I can get to make the best decision possible and still make a decision in a reasonable time? Like I got to just decide and move forward. And so that skill set uh, of people is a lot less about did you take a class where you learned something and much more about did you learn how to make decisions? Did you learn how to work with teams? Did you learn how to pull the best out of people? Did you learn how to get people trust you? Did you learn how to get people excited about what you're doing so that they helped you? My career at Microsoft, I would say, was, was only partly based on my skill. Um, it was mostly based because people liked me and they got excited about my work because they trusted me and they believed in my work. And I believed in, you know, I, I made sure it was credible. Uh, but what I realized was, they, they cleared a lot of the decks for me. They, they allowed me to do much more than I should have ever been entitled to do as a young, you know, I was a super, I was the youngest vice president of Microsoft. Like, that's kind of cool. But, but I only got there because people looked after me. Uh, and that was because they trusted me and they believed in me. So, so I look for those qualities. So that's why, to me, like, as an engineer, and the problem with the engineering discipline is it's too, there's just too much, too many classes, like too many engineering classes that, you're not going to use like that. We should be more rounded. We should think about how do you get an, how do you get somebody with technical skills to change the world and to come in and, and you're going to learn more in the first three years in your company about engineering than you ever will at university. <laughs> right. But what you need to do is come in with an attitude and a skill set and a drive and an ability to work with ambiguity and not know the answers and to try to figure out without direction, how are you going to, what do I do today? Like that's the skill set. So anyway, I went off on a tangent. But. No, that was awesome. Um, so we have time for one more question. And um, this one's more for you personally, because it seems like you've sampled everything that one could sample and have a career, you know, both sides of the table, big, small companies. Um, so if logistics weren't an issue, where do you see yourself heading or where do you want to be in the near distant future? logistics weren't an issue meaning i could live anywhere or what was yeah that? yeah if uh if you could do anything you wanted without being constrained by reality well i i don't i don't really feel like i'm constrained by reality so that might be like that might be kind of a crazy uh i've been financially successful enough that you know i get to choose what i do and that is a incredible freedom um, and I think that is a fun, you know, it's a, it's a phenomenal thing to have. Um, and it allows me to, to live where I want to live and do what I want to do. And this is what I want, right? So I want to live in San Francisco. I want to be in the heart of the tech sector. I want to be at Apple. Um, you know, I want to work on my side projects. I want to still go ski when I can. Like I got to do pretty much, uh, I get to do that. I don't feel constrained at all. Um, my only constraint is time. I just wish I had, you know, I wish I could sort of duplicate a day and have a day where I did this and a day where I did that. And somehow it was the same day. Um, and, uh, and I could get, you know, more done. So prioritization, um, you know, people I spend my time with all, all matter. I mean, I'm, I'm, um, you know, I'm incredible fortunate. I, I do want to still start things. I love that. I'm trying now in Apple to do that. I'm trying to do a startup inside of Apple. Um, that will be a fun experiment for me. And if it works well, it'll be a new skill. Uh, and so I'll, I'll feel like I'm still growing. Um, but I also want to engage with my, you know, kids. I would love to have a project right now with, uh, with my kids uh, who are in their twenties. One's an engineer from case, one's a business guy. And, you know, I'm, doing a little startup with them and, and uh, trying to, you know, do that. And it's all, it's just, I enjoy it. That's I, 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 I do get to do what I, what I want. 
Awesome. So it looks like we have about seven minutes left. Um, Great. If, and if you wouldn't mind answering this uh, fairly briefly, but um, I'll just ask if it's better to be focused on one expertise or to be more widely applicable. You know, uh, it all depends on what you're trying to do. Uh, you know, I think for some people, they love to be deep and narrow, like, hey, do you want to be a surgeon who does, you know, heart transplants or do you want to be a, a generalist? Um, uh, I, for me, um, I decided that I like to reinvent myself. Um, so Microsoft put me into a, you know, my first job at Microsoft was a systems engineer. Didn't even know what that was. I did it. It was really awesome. We were growing so fast. They said, hey, we needed to do this thing. And then we hired a head of sales. We fired the head of sales. So they said, hey, will you just run sales for a little bit? Because like, we need somebody in there. And I didn't know anything about it. And I went and did it and learned that. And then they said, then they said hey, we, we just fired the head of tech support. Will you go run tech support? And I know nothing about tech support, but like, they're like, but we trust you. And I jumped into all of those roles um, uh, and found out that I really love it. I love learning a new product. I love the idea that I was reinventing myself. I love the fact that I didn't know it that well and I had to quickly, uh, I had to quickly learn some new skills. Um, and then once things got to be pretty stable, I put somebody in charge of it who like actually knew it and could do it really well. And that allowed me to go to the next thing. So, uh, so I pretty much have done that my whole career, which is I've just reinvented myself. Um, uh, I love that. For me, it's great. So, and, the, and I, I love being in positions where I, I don't have deep expertise and I got to go and figure it out. Um, that's me personally. That's what, that's what motivates me. Um, and so it's what your comfort zone is. I like being uncomfortable. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, maybe I'm just a glutton, uh, you know, maybe that's the skill set of an, you know, trait of an entrepreneur. I don't really know, but like I, uh, I am, I like to reinvent myself, um, you know, and I, I hope to keep doing that, you know, all the way to the end. Thank you so much. Um, well, I'm going to pass back to Michael now to wrap up, um, but thanks so much for being so refreshing and insightful. It was pretty eye-opening. Awesome, Raya. Thank you so much for moderating. Um, you did a great job. Um, and thanks to everybody who participated. It was a really nice, diverse set of um, folks. I know there's some students, some alums, some community members, um, some prospective students that, that are looking at the school that know the admissions folks sent this out. Um, Sam, this is great. It was funny when you're talking about reinvention and, and the fact maybe we hadn't met before. I may have seen, I was at Red West working for Ed Freeze's group. It was the oh, Ed really? meeting zone oh, when I was an MBA intern. And it was funny, Microsoft, my, my experience previous, I was at Wharton and previous to Wharton, I ran voter education programs for the South African election. So I was <laughs> reinventing myself. Oh. In 1997 at, uh, at Red West, I'd fly on some shuttle <laughs> next to you. Oh, that's hysterical. Yeah, absolutely. Right when that, that what, what year is that? Uh, so this would have been the summer of 90, summer of 98. Yeah. Summer of 98. Cool. Yeah, Red West was just opening up, I think, back so then, maybe it was in a year or two, yeah. It wasn't free good. food at the cafeteria, but it was, it was pretty good. Yeah, it's a good, good time. Yeah, no, I think it's a... It's a great, it's a great, uh, it's a great thing for me. It like works for some people, you know, you want to be the best in the world at something or you find your niche and you just kind of figure out how to apply it in different ways. But the cool thing is, you know, we have a long, we have long, you know, we're going to live longer hopefully than, you know, anybody in, in our prior history. And, and so you've graduated, you know, your early twenties, you got a long way to long way to go. So make it interesting, you know, make it enjoyable. Like, you know, um, keep it, you know, keep it going. I, I don't like to golf that much. I, I'd much rather start a business and hang out with, you know, people who want to do something and figure out how to help make them successful and know that it doesn't always work, but like, you know, the journey is what we're about. Awesome. No, I couldn't agree more. Well, this is great. Well, thank you. It's awesome um, to reconnect with you. Um, as we mentioned, Artie Shadna will be um, joining us tomorrow at, at 1 p.m. Eastern, so uh, I guess 10 a.m. Uh, on the Pacific time, um, and we're continuing to do those. These, so we're we're. It's awesome to be able to connect with alums like Sam and others 
to kind of share their stories, particularly in light of the crisis. And given the fact that we're all sort of mostly sitting at home, um, sort of glued to our, our computers and connected to our devices, this is a great way to sort of share and, and broaden our community. So Sam, thank you again for taking the time and thanks everybody for connecting. And Rakav, thank you for moderating and hope to see you at another session soon.